Well, good morning. Welcome to the service this morning. I want to welcome you that are gathered here as well as those that are watching online. We still have several doing that. And uh, we uh, want to uh, encourage you to sing and rejoice this morning as we worship the Lord together. Uh, one of the things I want to just kind of bring your attention to, we've, uh, we've been made aware that there are uh, two, or th two or three churches that have had to close because of cases within the church. Uh, hopefully they'll be getting started back soon once they find out some things. But Hunter's Bridge is not having service this morning. Macedonia Drake Sexton was uh, 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 found out that he, he tested positive for COVID, so Macedonia is being affected by this. As we gather in here this morning, one of the things we want to encourage you because of that, and also this morning, uh, as a note of encouragement, as, as a note of uh, that relates to that, we are down to about 70% on the air conditioning. So we've got one side that is entirely down, so it may get a little warm. And so as you go out this morning, please, please try to uh, maintain a measure of distance because of the heat and the lack of air conditioning uh, that we have uh, seems to be one of those things that sort of exacerbates the problem. And uh, so we just encourage you to maintain a little social distancing as you go out this morning. Let me give you quickly uh, some updates on the prayer list. Uh, one is uh, Whithow had uh, an ablation and understand that he's back home. Um, so please uh, keep him in, uh, in your prayer. Also, uh, Kevin Stearns. Kevin had uh, a tumor removed from his kidney. Uh, he's back home, and we we'll, should find out the biopsy on that this coming week, right, Sylvia? All right. Uh, Viet, Viet had a fall, and uh, I saw him yesterday, and the whole side of his face was black and blue where he had fallen. Um, Bonner, uh, the last word that I received on Bonner when I talked with, uh, with him the other day was that Bonner uh, is about 70% better. Medications, he was having some problems with the combination of medications and it was really keeping him heavily sedated. And so I don't know if they, if he's just coming out of that now or if they've made some medication changes. I know he had a doctor's appointment uh, Friday and I haven't heard back as to what the, the status of that was. Uh, Troy is not doing well. Uh, pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought something. And so please uh, continue to remember uh, Troy in your prayers. Uh, Terry goes to Duke in next week, and uh, we'll be uh, preparing for surgery there. And then look back here, and, and Rodney informed me that Harold had a fight with the concrete, and concrete won. So uh, we're uh, sorry about that. I'm sorry you didn't do you didn't fare better against the concrete. <laughs> so please keep these folks in your prayers as we go to worship this morning. And uh, throughout the week, we've, we've got a lot of a lot of sickness and, and certainly a lot of uh, a lot of situations that exist that we need to be in prayer about. I want to, as we go into the service this morning, I'm going to do something in, in the message this morning that I, I really don't like. I'm not fond of doing. Sometimes I will just for for the sake of uh, of a particular situation that goes on. I want to go back and pick up a series that I did probably a couple years ago and make some make some adjustments and applications to it. And uh, the series that I did a couple years ago here at Rosemary is uh, This World is Not Our Home. And uh, so I want to focus on that this morning. And we're going to, this morning what we'll do is we're going to take, we'll, we'll start that series by looking at 1 Peter chapter 1. And that's the scripture I want us to read this morning as we share together. If, if those that are watching online, if you would get your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Those of you here, you can turn over there as well. But Peter speaks very relatively, uh, very relevantly to our situation in, uh, in, in the sense that they weren't going through a pandemic or uh, a major illness or sickness or anything like that. But the Christians in that day and time were experiencing a great deal of suffering at the hands of, of an, an imperial country, imperial Rome at the time. And so Christians then were suffering, and the, their suffering and what they were experiencing speaks to us today as, as we uh, experience suffering. And, and Peter encourages them, and that's what we want to do is find this letter 
to be a letter of encouragement or this series as a series of encouragement to us during these difficult, difficult times. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, down, uh, down through the 11th verse and then uh, we'll have a word of prayer and then the ladies will uh, lead us in worship and song this morning. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You're being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer a grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we praise you, we thank you for this day, the opportunity that we still have that we can gather in, in this uh, building for worship as your body of believers. We pray that as we worship this morning, that we would use this time in such a way that we honor and glorify you. Be with us as we not only sing praise to you, as we lift our, our voices in song, but also, Father, be with us as we uh, go to your word and we study this passage that we've talked about. In everything, Father, let us glorify you. Remember, be, let us be in remembrance of those that we've mentioned that are going through difficult trials, those congregations that have had to close their doors for a while as a result of, of the, uh, the virus and this pandemic. Let us be mindful of those that have had incidents whereby that they've been injured and are on beds of recovery, those that have undergone surgeries. In all things, Father, let us, let us just turn to you for the peace, the comfort, and the presence of mind to continue on steadfastly as your, as your servants in this world. In everything, Father, we pray, these, pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
Nero's persecution of Christians in 64 through 67 AD was, was probably one of the most extreme persecutions to occur uh, during the time, uh, during the early years of Christianity. And, but it, it was focused primarily in and around Rome at the time, uh, not so much the rest of the Roman Empire. Although the example of the emperor uh, encouraged any enemies of Christianity to impose persecution upon them or to take advantage of the opportunity or the slightest pretext to persecute Christians in that day and time. This was probably one of the most, as far as the early church is concerned, this was certainly one of the first and one of the most trying times of the early church. The church as a whole at this time, uh, when Peter writes this letter, is about 35 years old. Uh, it has suffered persecution in various places at the hands of mostly local authorities. But now, Imperial Rome, which had thus far been pretty much indifferent to Christianity, now Rome had decided that they wanted to focus their attention on the situation. And so the church has been accused, uh, is being accused of a terrible crime during this occasion. And so what Nero is doing as, as the leader of Rome at that time is he's taking steps to punish the church for accusations, which by the way are false accusations, against the church. So now we see that the church is going through a worldwide, as uh, the known world at that time, is going through a worldwide trial. As a matter of fact, Peter in, in chapter 5 and verse 9, he talks about that when he says, uh, regarding that, he says in verse 9, he says, resist him, re referring to the devil. It says, uh, stand firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. So this is when it, the churches that he's writing to, he, he wants them to understand that this is not just an isolated incident. This involves involves others as well. As a matter of fact, this involves the church at large. And so they're going through this fiery ordeal, and Christians were being burned nightly in, the, in Nero's gardens. And it, it looked as if the devil was about to devour the church. It looked as if what Peter says there in, in chapter 5, verse 8, that Satan roams about like a roaring lion, seeking those he may devour. It looked as if that was exactly what was happening and in in, in that the church was going to be devoured by the persecution that's going on. Now, it's thought that Peter may have written this letter immediately after Paul's martyrdom. And shortly, <clears throat> shortly before Peter's martyrdom, his own martyrdom, and Peter was probably martyred somewhere around 67, 68 AD. So the letter had been delivered by Silas or Silvanus, depending on what version you're reading, and who had been one of Paul's helpers to these churches which Paul had founded. And what he was doing was encouraging them to bear up under these sufferings. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we begin to examine this. Father, we praise you and we thank you that we have, uh, have been able to turn to examples and see that, that many times uh, when we look at the church throughout the world and we see uh, uh, just fiery ordeals that the church is going through and great suffering, suffering that's th th whereby Christians are, are dying at the hands of those who are opposed to the church and opposed to Christianity. And then we see this, the suffering that goes on within our own uh, within our own, within the scope of our own country, as people uh, die at the hands of, of a pandemic, and and we 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 realize that there are family members who are losing family members, and 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 just there's a great deal of suffering that goes on. But we should understand something, Father. And I, I think as we read this, and I think that we will see that is that this suffering is is something that, as you have told us in other places in your Word, that is common to man. One of the things that I realize in my, in my search, Father, of your word is the one thing that we're promised as Christians is suffering. And so I, I pray that you would just help us to, to, to establish the mental fortitude that we might bear up under the adverse situations, the adverse conditions that may be presented to us as Christians. And that we might rise to the occasion whereby that we can, we can think 
think wisely, think clearly, that we can that we can generate within ourselves the, that measure of common sense that's needed to to rise above the occasion, but also to to encourage others to do likewise. And so I pray, Father, as we go into your word this morning, that you speak to us clearly through the presence of your Holy Spirit as he works through this word. And that in everything we would honor you, not only by the words we hear, but by being doers of the word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled this message, this, or this series, This World is Not My Home. We're going to look at the first part of this this morning. Part two we'll look at next week. But I want you to just stop and think about how that Peter relates to us. It's sort of like this. You know, if we stop and consider that two friends decide that they're, they're going to stop somewhere for coffee, they've been walking along, and before long, before long as they sit down to coffee, one of the friends begins hearing the problems of the other. And perhaps the conversation goes something like this. Bill, he says, he says, I've about come to the end of my road. I don't know whether I can go on or not. My boss says that unless my sales increase, he's going to have to let me go. My wife is, is on the point of leaving me because I may lose my job and, and, and I'm just falling into this brink of depression. And the children, even our children, are having problems. Bill, I'm desperate. And so Bill only came for a cup of coffee. Bill didn't come to be counselor that day. But suddenly he finds himself thrust into the situation as counselor and, and his, his, in his hands is someone who is desperate. Someone who is in trouble. So what does he say in this situation? How does he deal with this? Well, un unfortunately, what Bill does is he says things in, in, in this situation that are unhelpful. He says things that in some ways are very inappropriate as we would complete this scenario or this scene. He may look to Joe and he may say, Joe, you think you've got problems. You don't know the half of it. You ought to hear my story. You ought to hear about some of the things that I've been going through. And with that, Bill excuses himself and leaves. Or, come on, cheer up, Bill. That isn't so bad. Or cheer up, Joe, that isn't so bad. Everything's going to be fine. No problem. It'll all work out. Things usually work out. Don't worry about it. And as quickly as Bill can, he grabs the check and he leaves. Or maybe the situation's like this. Yes, Joe, I, I know just how you feel. And Bill rises. Because Joe doesn't know how, he's feel, how he feels. Because he's never been through what this man's been through. It's like someone said one time, said, said the, the obstetrician came into the lady who was in labor, and if you've ever been in that labor room, you know what that's like. And so uh, the obstetrician comes in, he pats the woman on the shoulder, and he says, there, there, I know just how you feel. You see, in short, in short, it's, it's this, folks, in real desperation, someone in real desperation has come to us for encouragement or come to you for encouragement. But how do you respond? Has it, has it helped them or has it not? Peter's, last, Peter's letter here, both letters were born in a desperate situation that existed uh, among all the small churches in the area of Asia Minor, which is present day Turkey. The people were in trouble. They were, they were desperate for some type of counsel, some type of encouragement that would benefit them. They were the, their leaders within the churches. They didn't know what to say. And so they're, they're turning to Peter. They're voicing it, their concerns to Peter. What do we say, Peter? What can we do? And so what does Peter do? do he, he responds with this letter of hope and encouragement. And his purpose in all of this was to bolster the faith of these terrified, terrified Christians. They were living under the constant threat of imprisonment. 
They were living under the constant threat of execution, all at the hands of Roman authorities. And Peter knew how afraid they were. He, he felt their pain. He empathized with them. He, didn't, he, could, he not only did he sympathize, but he knew how they felt. And so he writes these two letters to strengthen them. How did he do it? What was his strategy? as he tried to bolster the faith of these anxious Christians. Because I think that's the lesson we need to learn as we try to bolster the faith of those who are anxious during these times. We need to try to be understanding. And we need to try to just encourage people along through the situation. But Peter understood what these Christians needed. And we should learn from this as well. What they needed was not to know why they were suffering. They needed to know Rather, how they could endure it. How can I bear up? What is, there, what is there available to me that I can find a measure of hope and peace and comfort in? What does God, what does God say to me during this time? And so sprinkled throughout this letter are words of, of encouragement. Words of seeking to explain how that they can keep on keeping on. Peter says in, in our text, uh, if you move down a little further into verse 22 of that cha of chapter 1, he says, show sincere brotherly love for each other. From a pure heart, love one another constantly. You know how you can help? Encourage one another by, by, by just, just listening. Just hearing what they have to say. Loving them. And then he goes on in, in chapter 4, verse 8, again, he says this. He says, above all, maintain constant love for one another. And what he's saying in all of this is if, I, if in the fellowship of the church you can love one another, if you can find there a spirit of rich, supportive love, if you can find that, then you can find the strength to endure to grasp that, to catch that, he's saying if you can find people gathered around you who are trying to encourage you, build you up, nurture you through a time that you may be anxious about. You may, as, personally, you may be anxious as well, but we need to encourage and bolster one another in the faith. And Peter says if you can find that, you can endure. Peter's writing out of his own experience with Jesus Christ to real people who are going through tough times. And his letter speaks to Christians like us today so relevantly. I've learned the interesting thing about, about this book is that among, pers among persecuted Christians in other parts of the world, this book is a favorite. We may not consider it our favorite. As a matter of fact, we may not read it very often other than maybe a cursory reading when we read through the Bible. But it certainly speaks to us today. And like Peter, we can rejoice in our love for Jesus Christ. And like Peter, we can hold firm in our faith in him because of these timeless truths. These words relate to us. One, another put, uh, one, one author put it this way. He said, this book brings us timeless truths for troubled times. And so that's what I want us to look at. I want us to look at that truth, that this world is not my home. There's the encouragement. There's the hope. There's the promise. Folks, we're aliens. We're scattered in the world. God calls us as strangers in hostile territory. We're sailing through uncharted waters. We've never been this way before. Danger lurks on every side. It doesn't necessarily have to be a pandemic. It can be, it can be other forces that await us to, to, to bring peril to our lives. It may be another sickness. It can be cancer. It can be, it, it can be we can make fall, perhaps fall prey to, to a situation whereby that we, might, we might suffer death at the hands of someone accidentally, a car accident. A plane crash. There, there's, there, there's occasion whereby that we face danger every day in our lives. And we need to learn what our relationship to this world ought to be in order to bear up under that situation. 
And one of the first things that we need to understand is this, and this is what Peter's telling us. He said, Christians, he said, understand this. Look at this. We were scattered before the world. Notice that first point. We were scattered before the world. Christians have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The Trinity worked together for our salvation. God the Father thought it. God says, let us make man in our own image. It's the thought of God. God decided that, you know what, he, and, and it, wasn't a, it wasn't just a cursory thought. It just wasn't something that was just passing by. It was actually that he thought this out. Christians are God's elect, and don't let that word distress you. That simply means that if you're a Christian, you're a wanted child. You're not an accident. You weren't an afterthought. God didn't go through creation and say, you know what, there's something missing here. What, what do we need now? Let's see. Why don't we make why don't we make something like like maybe uh, mankind? We'll call them mankind. That's not the way it happened. God chose, purposely chose to make you, to create you. You're not an afterthought because before all of creation was ever set in place, you were in the heart of God. Mankind was in the heart of God. Creation was created for us. You are special to God. Not an afterthought. And then God, the Holy Spirit, wrought it, someone said. Because it comes about by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. There again, we get caught up sometimes in this terminology. And don't let that word scare you either. Because it simply means that he sought you and he set you aside for a holy purpose. The Spirit through the word of God is gathering us. God's spirit convicts the world of sin. The spirit through the word of God is gathering us and setting us aside for a purpose that we might be obedient to Jesus Christ. We're utterly dependent upon the spirit for our salvation because, he, because God, the purpose of his Holy Spirit is to convict us. And if we're never convicted of sin, we have no reason to obey Jesus. Because the spirit, but the Spirit through the Word of God is gathering us and setting us aside for His purpose. Setting us aside that we may obey Jesus Christ. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility come together and we must respond. This passage also tells us that, if, if, that, we, that we can be saved if we choose to be saved. We can become Christians if we choose to become Christians. Whosoever will may come. And then he talks about the role, and then Peter implies and infers the role of the, of the son in all of this, and how that the son bought and paid for this. Paid for us. We're sprinkled with his blood. And when Peter does this, he draws upon his knowledge of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, people were sprinkled with blood on certain occasions. You know, it was just, it was the process that took place. Blood was sprinkled when a leper was cleansed from leprosy. The leper, uh, leprosy it was, was sort of perceived as, as those in the New Testament looked back and saw the symbolism. Leprosy was perceived as this figure of sin. The leper faced this disgraceful death. He was like sin. He was separated from those that, those that loved him. Like sin, he had to live. He had to live with others of the like persuasion. He had to live with other lepers. Like sin, he had to pronounce himself unclean. And so, in the Old Testament, the priests examined the leper. If no lepers had remained, then a dove would be killed over a vessel, and the blood of the slain dove would flow into the vessel of clear, sparkling water. And then a second dove was plunged into the earthen vessel until it was saturated with the blood and the water. And the priest then took the dove to an open field that was saturated with blood and water, and he released it. And the dove flew away with blood dripping from its wings. And, and so in that situation, one bird died, the other was set free. Jesus Christ died that we might be free. 
and after this the remaining blood then was sprinkled on the leper. You've been bought at a price, not silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. Water and blood cleanse us as we become heaven bound. And then the priest or the, on another occasion, the priests were consecrated into the priesthood through the blood. A third, a third representation in the Old Testament is the sprinkling of blood came when God made a covenant with his people. Moses read the terms of the covenant to the people, and, and after they agreed to the terms, the blood was placed on the altar, and the rest was sprinkled upon the people. Uh, it was to ratify, to confirm the covenant. You see, those things are involved in the shedding of Jesus' blood. Cleansing, consecration, and commitment to a covenant. When you became a Christian, you were cleansed of your sin. You were consecrated. In other words, you said, I, and you catch this, folks, you said, I am dedicating myself to serve God, to live for God. And I am committed to keeping his covenant. It's an everlasting covenant with our God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing that, that I want us to see this morning is that we're scattered through the world. Right? Scattered through the world. It, it, this kind of draws upon the, and, and I have to believe that when Peter's talking about this, it draws upon that imagery of Jesus teaching, and he's talking about how that he's sowing seed and how that this, this seed is, it is cast out or broadcast out and how that the seed can produce uh, as the seed hits the ground it produces and some falls on, on rocky soil some falls on in, the, in and weeds grow up with it but other falls on good soil and, and Peter's drawing upon the good soil and how that we're scattered through the world we're scattered as strangers for them what he's, what he's also relating is the fact that they're, they're scattered because they're persecuted you see, in, in the year AD 64, Nero burned, as we were talking about, Nero burned portions of Rome. Nero might be considered probably one of the first urban planners of his day. He wanted to rebuild Rome. He wanted to, re, it, to reflect his personality. He wanted it to reflect his, ideal, his ideology. And so he had to get rid of a part of Rome and that was the slums. Yes, there were slums in Rome. And so what Nero decided, he says, well, I'll just set the slums on fire. And so he had henchmen burn the city. He didn't, he, the one thing he didn't count on is he didn't count on the backlash from the people because he burned the slums, because he set the city on fire. And it was at that occasion that Nero stops and he, has, he, he says, he begins to think, as historians relate this, these events to us, he begins to think, I've got to find someone to blame this on. I can't let people know that I decided that I was going to burn the city. And so it's, it's during this time that Nero finds a scapegoat. And Christians became the scapegoat, the likely candidate. Because... After all, Christians were always talking about it, a baptism and a, and a judgment of fire. And besides, they were strange people, eating flesh and drinking blood. You know, that, that stuff they talked about with, the, with their connections with the Passover feast and, and what they called the Lord's Supper and how that they ate the flesh of Jesus and they drank the blood of Jesus. They were just really strange individuals. And so Nero accused them of being pagans and said they were the ones who burned the city. And so persecution at that time with that background falls upon the Christians. And history tells us that some of them were dipped in oil, they were tied to stakes, and they were actually literally set on fire. Many were crucified. Others had animal skins tied to them, hunted like packs of dogs, and eventually run through with spears, arrows, and swords. Persecution like that happens today. In, 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 my, in my occasions of missionary travels, 
one of the one of the occasions was I was in Haiti very uh, during a very tumultuous time. And if you weren't in agreement with what the president of Haiti at that time was doing, if they found out that you weren't, his henchmen would pull you out into the street and make an example of you by putting tires around you and chaining you to those tires and setting those tires on fire. And there were occasions where we saw, trying to get out of Haiti, there were occasions where we saw what was left of burned tires and smell of burned flesh. It happens. People suffer. They were destitute. And that's the way Christians were in Peter's day. That's what he's writing to. And really, in some ways, it's apples and oranges compared to what we're going through today. It really, what we experience is nothing compared to what the early church experienced. And so it forced them to flee and to scatter. But it's, it's interesting that as they scattered as strangers, they also scattered as seed. And the word scattered has this idea that falls back on what Jesus taught of seed being sown. You see, we're seed. And we're scattered by the per they were scattered by the persecution of Nero. We have the opportunity to be seed. The, that seed which plants the word, the message of the gospel in the lives of people that are asking questions right now. Why? Does this ever end? I don't know. But I'll tell you this, whether you die in this day and time or whether it's next year or the year after or 10 years from now, the fact is you need to be ready to meet the Lord. And that's the seed. And see, the, here's the thing about it is this persecution spread through the church. So those who scattered went on their way preaching the word. And it's not God's will. We need to understand this. It's not God's will that seed should rot in the barn. I think about the, the farmer that Jesus talks about and how that he had such a bountiful crop that he said, I'll just build bigger barns and keep my seed or keep, keep my crops there. I wonder how much of that he lost. I wonder how much just rotted that went to waste when it could have helped others. I wonder how much uh, of what we do is just rot in the barn. Go, it's just waste that could go to helping others. You see, we've been saved out of this world, sent back into this world to save this world. That's the only business we have in the world. As, as members, as part of the body of Christ, as members of the kingdom of God, our business is to save the world. Go, preach the gospel, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are ambassadors for our king, and we're ambassadors upon foreign soil. We're aliens. This world is not my home. And then kind of bring this to a close and tie this all together. We're scattered as saints. We're saints. Sanctified by the Spirit. We're, we're to be, it's God's intention that we be in the world but not of the world. We're just passing through. Someone has said we ought to pray, Lord, if I'm building a nest down here, put a thorn in it. Because if you settle down into this world, you're going to get into big trouble. If you think all of this is all there is, you're going to be sorely disappointed. This world is not my home. In chapter 2 of 1 Peter and verse 11, listen to these words as we kind of draw this to a conclusion. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles Catch this word, strangers and exiles. You're Christians, but you don't belong here. There's a place you belong, and this is not it. 
as strangers and exiles, I encourage you, I urge you to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Wow. Steer clear of the things of the world because all they're going to do is wage war against your mind, against your emotion, against your will. I like to think of it like this. To have one foot in the world and one in heaven is like spiritual schizophrenia. Too often we want just enough Christianity and just enough of the world. And when that happens, we're miserable. General Dwight Eisenhower said, there are no victories at discount prices. Folks, catch nothing else. Grasp this as we, as, as we prepare for our hymn of decision, our invitation time. The question is this. Are we looking for peace? A peace that surpasses all understanding at this time? Are we looking for joy, an overwhelming joy that resides and lifts our spirits beyond understanding? Are we looking for victory? Then let go of this world with both hands and take hold of the Lord with both hands. You can't hold on to one in one hand and one in the other and be anything less than miserable. I say this, if he is worth anything, then Jesus is worth everything. Amen? Make up your mind. Don't be a sick saint. Don't be a spiritual neurotic. Let go of the world. Put your hope and your trust in the only one that's, that's going to take you out of this world. The only hope that you can possibly have. And that's Jesus Christ, who will help you win the war against the flesh and help you secure your soul for heaven. Let's stand as we sing the hymn of invitation. If you're outside of Christ, would you come and sing? Uh, they were divisive over 
uh, over how that they should live their lives, whether they could live their lives in, in a sense of pleasure and at the same time still be in service to the Lord. And, and Paul goes through, a, 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 his letter is just a, a dissertation of trying to correct a lot of, of problems. And then there's this division that occurs with respect to the Lord's Supper and how that it was, it just became something, it's just something they did. It was, it, it was almost like it, it had, in a sense, lost its, its significance, its meaning. And Paul tries to impress upon them that if it came from Jesus, if it was directed from Jesus, it has purpose. And so he writes to the Corinthians and talks about this. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As I said last week, when we do this in the right frame of mind, when we come to this moment with the right attitude, we're proclaiming Christ. We're proclaiming that we have the victory through Jesus. I want you to think on these words as we sing our communion hymn, and then Billy Williams is going to come, and he's going to lead us as we take uh, this communion together.
want to thank you for joining us this morning and uh, those online as well. We, uh, we thank you for joining us and uh, hope that you have a great day as we uh, prepare to dismiss. Um, just continue to pray. Hope that you found some encouragement in the words that were shared. And if I would encourage you to continue to read that letter of First Peter and uh, as we begin, as we continue to explore it over the coming weeks. And in all things, just remember this. This world is not my home. So let's bow for a word of prayer as we close. Father, we praise you and we thank you. Bless this time we've had together. Grant us that we might another week serve, honor, and glorify you. Through the precious name of Jesus, amen.